Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ned Rock Menino, non-resident senior fellow with the Foreign Policy Research Institute uh, and a, leading the strategic advisory and com commercial diplomacy fir firm, Portsmouth Limited Company. Uh, and we are here today to talk about U.S. institutional investment, encouraging our U.S. institutional investors to explore and engage markets in Africa. So we're going to jump right into it. I will note that a friend of mine often says, Africa is a passion or an unknown, and to many of our U.S. institutional investors, Africa is still a bit of an unknown, but perhaps we can point to some of the reasons for that and also some secondary steps to encourage our U.S. investors to explore the market. So without any more talk, we're gonna get right into our panel introductions. Uh, we are joined by four outstanding voices lending their expertise and insight to the conversation. I'm gonna let them introduce themselves in the interest of time, starting with David. David Grayson, this, we'll start yes, with you. Yes, this is on. Hi, David Grayson from Auerbach Grayson in New York City. Uh, we are best described as a US-based global broker that does business in over 120 markets around the world. Uh, we've been bringing investors into Africa specifically since 1994. And uh, uh, our business is primarily equities, investing equities for major institutions, not only in the US, but also Europe. Hi, I'm uh, Dean Tyler, and I run the global markets at Bank Trust. Uh, Bank Trust has been around for about 20 years. We're a UK-based investment bank focused purely on emerging markets. Historically, Latin America focused, but in the last two, three years, probably 70% of what we do is actually in the Africa and uh, and, and, and a little bit of uh, CIS space as well, but mainly Africa. Purely debt focused, as I say, working really on behalf of sovereigns, corporates, and, and raising financing in the 50, 50 million up, so like 50 to 300 million is our, is our kind of sweet spot at Bank Trust. Thanks. Um, hello, uh, my name is Pap Jai, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm the chief executive of um, AFIG Funds, we uh, are a private equity investor. Um, we're sector agnostic and cover about 32 countries um, in sub-Saharan Africa and basically north of uh, South Africa and the Southern Africa, I guess, main influence zone. Um, we have already um, deployed two funds and are about to uh, raise our third fund. We have about a quarter billion dollars under management and uh, mostly focus on West and Central Africa. Thank you, and I uh, look forward to the conversation. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Leslie Marbury. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Prosper Africa. Uh, Prosper Africa is a US government initiative to increase trade and investment between the United States and countries in Africa. Um, we coordinate across uh, 17 different departments and agencies of the U.S. government and come in to partner with the private sector to advance deals, promote opportunities, and strengthen investment climates. Um, the U.S. government has an enormous amount of tools that range from matchmaking to grants, technical assistance, and financing. Um, what Prosper Africa adds is uh, three things. We um, enable those tools by making them easier to access, serving as an easy point of entry um, to help the private sector navigate. We enhance the tools by bringing some uh, sector flexible, country flexible funding um, to respond to private sector needs and help them along their deal journey. Um, and we elevate we elevate by um, recognizing that the narrative for investing in Africa is often um, negative and, and exacerbating misperceptions around risk. So flex the commercial diplomacy piece of the U.S. government um, and others to try to address that. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, everybody. And you know I'll, that's a great segue right into my first question. Before we start talking about the opportunities and maybe the first moves. I first want to address the, that hesitancy for U.S. institutional investors for engaging African markets. So, Leslie, starting back with you, can you speak to some of that hesitancy, why U.S. entities might be hesitant to come to Africa, and what you are doing to overcome it? Sure. Um, thanks again. Uh, it's fun to take that question right back. Um, you know, we, we see, we do see hesitancy, but we also are seeing from recognizing from number year, a number of years ago that um, 
some of the large U.S. pension funds were looking beyond the U.S. for risk-adjusted returns and seeking uh, to find places that had an environment and social impact. Um, uh, that combined with the financing gaps that we were seeing in Africa, we came in and started engaging with our the, with investors directly to figure out what are some of the things that the U.S. government could do to change that. And what we hear from them consistently is a lack of data and information, um, a need for more tools to mitigate risk, um, and uh, some concerns about the enabling environment that um, I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit more. Um, so we decided uh, a number of years ago to try to harness this momentum um, and partner with U.S. asset managers um, on investor trips to Africa, where we try to invest, uh, introduce them to um, concrete transactions, uh, to credible partners, um, and potential co-investors to, in a nutshell, show them where that lucrative deals could happen um, and that risk is not as high as their, um, th their perspective. And we're really seeing some green shoots from this work. We're seeing um, U.S. pension funds starting to really ask the right questions about Africa. We're seeing local consortium of African pension funds forming on the continent and engaging with their U.S. partners. And now we have some examples to talk about of some really some scale level bond transactions that um, um, introduce U.S. investors to African issuers. Um, so we have some examples of that, but I think for, rather than listen to me, the bureaucrat talk, I, I think it's much more interesting to hear from um, our colleagues, in particular uh, my friend, Papa Njai, who has worked with us more directly and has been on this journey. Thank, thank you, Leslie. Uh, I'll start by basically saying that um, I've, been, um, I've been working to, uh, uh, to sort of channel uh, capital into Africa um, in different forms for about, you know, over 20 years or so. And um, this is the first time that I've seen um, U.S. Um, capital actually with a pathway to uh, deployment into Africa. And I think the biggest uh, um, difference maker on that has been the trips um, because uh, when you visiting people in their various places in, I don't know, San Francisco, Chicago, South, uh, and um, Los Angeles and whatnot, it's not the same difference as when they land on the continent and they see and they have their own opinion, they have their own experience, and then they can go be an ambassador to their boards and to uh, their um, uh, various decision-making bodies. And um, so it's, it's, been, it's been quite phenomenal. The, the biggest difference is the reasons I see for some of the slowdown, uh, some of the reasons why things haven't picked up yet, but as I said, these trips help a lot um, uh, make that happen, is one is cultural difference. And not the generic cultural difference that you would expect, but more uh, um, institutional cultural difference. African GPs and African asset um, allocators do not necessarily understand fully well the pension fund world that is somewhere mixed between um, deploying of capital in a professional way and politics because some people on their various member uh, boards are actually appointed. That, so if you're in an area where there are issues of U.S. politics that are taking place, you will get questions about those things. So you need to know what's going on with, with that. Uh, number two is understanding um, that a lot of these institutions um, um, are basically uh, backed by mandate to act in a, in a certain conservative way. So it's a lot easier for them to deploy into a Blackstone, a Blackrock, because if anything goes wrong, you say, well, it's Blackrock. Um, whereas if you take the chance to actually find a phenomenal opportunity with a, a, an asset allocator in Africa, um, and they do really well, and then, I don't know, there's a stumble or there's an issue in one of the countries where they operate, even if it doesn't affect them, there's panic because, you know, you've made a, a career-threatening move, so to speak. Um, so I think, you know, r r making investments that requires that type of courage is not easy. Um, so I think, you know, having this, this, this organization that, that certainly Leslie and, and, and company have been doing to get everybody together so that you don't feel you're alone as an, 
as a U.S. pension manager has been an incredible uh, uh, helper. Lastly is uh, the issue of size. A lot of these institutions um, uh, go into the tens and twenties and thirties and hundreds of billions of dollars in the management. And of that, they will have a certain percentage that is dedicated to uh, alternatives, and then they'll have within alternatives a certain uh, percentage that's dedicated to emerging markets and within emerging markets, Africa. Now, it's not just that in terms of uh, gradation, but also in terms of complexity of decision making, because you have to clear all those different hurdles in order to deploy the capital. So I think the fact that we are where we are today is, is testament to the fact that we've made incredible progress because now uh, there's acceptance that it's okay to move from you know that, that top level macro mm -hmm. all the way into deploying into, into uh, Africa. And I'll, I'll end with an example with ourselves where um, uh, three years ago, uh, Chicago teachers decided to do the first, uh, um, what you call it, uh, RFP, a request for proposal to uh, pick uh, one or two fund managers to actually manage some of their money into Africa. And it was an incredible process uh, to go through. Uh, there were about 30, 30, 35 um, bidders from all around the world, from Asia, from Africa, et cetera. Then they went through, I think we had to submit about 70 to 100 pages of documentation, separate from you know uh, the, the, the actual uh, um, data rooms and so on. And then they cut them down to about uh, about six that um, actually were invited into Chicago to <clears throat> to the present to present to the board, uh, and then from there they made a decision on two, and we were fortunate to to be one of those two. Uh, but the process is was incredibly thorough, but it gave everybody else some confidence that you can do that. And the way we've deployed their capital um, within literally about 18 months, and that giving them <coughs> cash on cash returns already, those are the things that they want to be able to, able to tell others and say, our experience so far has been positive, despite all of the things that are happening in the world. So thank you. Thanks, Papa. Um, just, just from our, our point of view, obviously, as I mentioned, Bank Trust is, is focused on, on in, in the debt world. I've been in emerging markets 25 years, first 10 years on, actually on the buy side, so I totally hear where Papa's coming from, from his experience from, from the investor side. But fundamentally, the, 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 when you look at the emerging market debt world, there's about $1.7 trillion of dedicated EM debt funds out there, and at least 65% of that is in the U.S., so it's absolutely crucial for Africa that that connectivity with, with, uh, with the U.S. Is, is, is done properly. The biggest problem that Africa has is Latin America, which is basically in the, in the backyard of, of, of the U.S. and uh, the number of U.S. investors. And this is definitely more a historical problem than a current problem. We're just basically lazy and why should I bother looking anywhere else in the emerging markets when I've got so much Latin American opportunity in my backyard and I've been looking at it for 25, 30 years. Um, that's definitely changed. We've seen that change uh, a lot in the last 10 years. I mean, even Bank Trust ourselves, we were 17 years purely LATAM, last three years you know, now pan, pan global EM. And as I say, 70% of what we do is, is, is really Africa space right now. It's where we see a lot of opportunities. And then it, it's really a mixture of uh, the support that you get from large global investment banks as well. After 25 years in EM, I've seen large global investment banks come and go from EM over and over again, non-core businesses getting cut. And it's very similar, we're going through this once again, very similar to 2009. And for some reason, every global bank seems to think a non-core business is emerging markets and forget the fact that's where all the growth and wealth in the world is actually being generated, apart from the west coast of the US, and there's not that much there anymore either. That's starting to, to, to tail off judging by what's happening with the NASDAQ. So it really is about that, that connectivity. Um, you know, Leslie and Papa have already talked about it. Research is really key. We keep all our research analysts on the ground uh, across Africa, uh, sim exactly the same as we did when we built out uh, Latin America, and give that local flavor. I think it, it, it's so important, rather than talking to some analysts based in London or based in New York who travels once in a while, you know, it really gives the investor base a lot of comfort knowing that there's someone who's living and breathing and can look out of the window and tell you what's going on out in the street. Um, and, and, and again, the trips, it's really important. You know, conferences like this are great. 
Uh, we attend as many as we can across Africa. We try and bring clients across as well. And equally, you know, Tuesday night, we're all heading off to, to DC where we'll be meeting a lot of clients there, IMF, World Bank meetings and, and auxiliary meetings around that. Really using that connectivity. And I, and I think you know, the IMF, World Bank meetings this week are, are, are really useful for that. But the AFSIC conference is our first time here, actually. And um, again, that, this connectivity is, is, is crucial to, to really drive this forward. So, um, as I said, we've been doing business in Africa uh, since 1994, <clears throat> first in South Africa and, and then in Zimbabwe. Uh, uh, and, and that worked out so well that uh, back then I looked at my partner and we said, why not be in every country in the world with a capital market system? So we pretty much achieved that. And then the days before internet and and emails, I just got on an airplane and started to travel around and make, make connections. Uh, just a couple of general observations. Um, one is I, I think this panel is mistitled. It's not just about America, it's also about Europe, although Europe has a slightly bigger edge on investment in, in, in Africa, uh, if for no other reason than its closer proximity and, and time zone. Um, the second thing is it's not the United States of Africa. Uh, every African country is, is, has its own culture and way of doing business. Uh, I would probably remove South Africa and Egypt from this discussion because those are pretty sophisticated liquid markets, uh, in particular South Africa. But the, the, again, speaking in generalities, the, the, the problem is, as I see it, um, unlike Europe, unlike uh, the US and, and many other parts of the world, uh, foreign investors, whether they be European or Middle Eastern or American, uh, want, want access to corporate, be, be able to speak to management in, in uh, a lot of these places. And I know we've been doing business as an example in Cote, Cote d'Ivoire for many years. We have clients who go down and they want us to set up business with companies only to find out that the companies won't even confirm the meetings till they're on the ground in, in Abidjan. And the problem is, is that a lot of these companies don't have a, a culture where the management are our owners. So how are they gonna be motivated or how are they gonna understand uh, uh, about increasing their share price and in, in, uh, speaking to investors and promoting their company to investors if they're not shareholders? Um, the other part of it also is you look at markets today, like Zimbabwe, where we used to have a lot of quote unquote American investors and, and European investors. Well, they all got burned because they, they got in, they couldn't get out. It was the Roach, Roach Hotel, as, as they say. Uh, you couldn't get dollars out. Same thing today in Nigeria. Uh, if, if you're stuck, uh, if, if you're invested in Nigeria, you're just churning your investments over and over again while you're queued up to get your dollars out. Uh, against that, there are some what I call mild success stories. Um, one of my favorites is, is in Ghana, which is a, a small market, but when the government uh, gave these uh, mobile phone license to MTN some years ago, they said to MTN, we'll give you the license, but part of the stipulation is that you have to list the company on the local exchange uh, within five years. Well, again, the company dragged their feet to doing it because the management weren't shareholders, but they did something very clever. They, they made sure that the local retail investors had a particular allocation uh, to buy shares, and, and, and the shares could only be subscribed through the MTN app on the phone, um, and we were involved in bringing in the foreign investors into it, so that's... That's, that's a story where you need more things like that uh, in Africa to make it happen. Um, either Papa or Laura, Laura mentioned pension funds. Uh, I think in Kenya, uh, a certain percentage of the pension fund money has to be invested in uh, 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 the local equity market. All those things add liquidity and, and and, and also uh, a retail presence in all of the markets. Um, because in general, retail investors included in the United States always think they're smarter than the foreign investors. So when the foreign investors are buying, the retailer's selling and, and vice versa.
but, but the good part of that is, is that adds, adds liquidity. And again, last in no particular order, it's besides from not having ready access to company management, it's sometimes tough to get research reports, quality research reports on companies. The companies aren't fully uh, transparent in their disclosures or communications. But on the other side of that, there are companies that are, are uh, transparent. So I, I take personally, uh, and as a company, we have a long-term positive view on Africa. Uh, and uh, I set aside what's going on in the world today because ultimately there, there will be more investment going on. Um, and just one, one other comment, you look at a country like Ethiopia, which has 114 million people and doesn't even have a stock exchange, which tells you something about the government's view. So you need, uh, of the market, you need government, um, intervention is the wrong word, but you need government support to uh, uh, bring money into the capital markets. Uh, you get money into the capital markets, local companies can expand and they hire more people and ultimately that can only serve to help the individual countries of, of Africa. Thank you, that was well framed. I'm gonna stay with that positive outlook and with you, David. Uh, considering the best ways uh, to promote Africa capital markets and companies, what trends or advantages are you seeing that might appeal to U.S. or other investors as you framed it? Sure, that's a, that's a good question. So um, we used to do a in-person conference in New York at the end of every October, Emerging and Frontier Market Conference. <laughs> Typically, 70, 80 uh, countries from emerging, from all over the world, uh, with 200 to 250 institutional investors attending. Today, for obvious reasons, uh, last year and the previous year and this year, the conference is virtual. So if, if, you're, if, you're, if you don't wanna travel to New York, and by the way, New York these days looks almost like London, it's, you would never know there was a pandemic, but if you don't wanna travel to New York, at least uh, get on a Zoom call and speak to investors. But even arranging that proves difficult. Again, going back to my, my uh, thoughts that it's, it's, if you're not, if you're company management, you're not shareholders yourself, you're not going to uh, 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 be motivated to talk to shareholders. There is, there is uh, a lot of you might know this, there is, there is an association of African stock exchanges. They have an African uh, conference every year. I've attended every now and then, but most years I don't attend because as an American, it's, it's, they hold it every year on one of the biggest uh, holidays that we have in the United States, Thanksgiving. So people aren't gonna travel, but they could use that by bringing in, rather than just making a love fest among stockbrokers, they could use that as a, uh, as a, as a venue for inviting companies and then inviting foreign investors along with it. Uh, or do a similar conference in the US where, where you do a Pan-African conference just focused on Africa. Dean, what are some of the trends you are seeing? So uh, th there's been a huge change in, in the last 10 years of, of what's been happening in the debt market in Africa. So one of, the, one of the challenges definitely is that it's the first time that Africa as a continent has external tradable debt and interest rates are going up. So we've never seen that before and you've seen that in the movement in, in yields, uh, you know, countries that could borrow five, six percent this time last year are now trading 14, 15 percent. Uh, but, you know, th this is really a function, nothing to do with Africa, obviously, it's to do with what's really the Fed's doing and the Bank of England and <laughs> obviously less, less relevant for the Bank of England, but you can see the liquidity even in the gilt market, how terrible it is. So. Imagine what it's like in, in Africa right now. But what weirdly that the, the you do have in, in, as, as, as a, on the positive side is, is also some of what's actually causing uh, the, 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 the need for the Fed to, to move these rates, and that's the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. So uh, if you think about as an investor, if I put my investor hat back on and you look at uh, global emerging markets in three buckets of Latin America, CEMIA, and Asia, you know, Latin America and, and, and Asia, plenty to, to look at there, but Simeo, where do you put your money to work? 
Right? Russia's off the table. That was obviously always one of the big areas that the money used to go in the last 25 years I've been in EM. South Africa is obviously a big draw, and, and that's why South Africa's done so well, but it's trading pretty damn tight and has plenty of its own, own problems. Turkey, you've always got Erdogan doing crazy stuff every now and again, so uh, you know, probably 50% of my clients love Turkey and 50% of them absolutely hate it. Um, so that really leaves the whole of the continent of Africa to potentially attract this, this, the, this money, because the Middle East is, is uh, just, to, just to mention briefly, is, is also trades extremely tight. You know, it's probably better money good right now than even the US uh, with the, with the uh, oil inflows. So you know, as a, I'm glad I'm on the sell side now, not a buy side, because I'd be struggling where I would put my money to work. So, uh, but, but the yields are looking pretty phenomenal in Africa. There's going to be a, a huge uh, period of, 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 of potential um, uh, defaults that we need to navigate our way through. Uh, I'm not saying a huge number of defaults, but, but we, we do have a, a 12 to 18 months ahead of us, as I say, with the interest rates rising and, and countries for the first time managing international investors. And then on top of that, you've got the very opaque negotiations between um, issuers and, and China as well, which uh, uh, is something that the bondholders absolutely detest because they have no idea what's really going on. And, um, and, and there really needs to be a much healthier relationship between uh, China and, and, and Africa uh, going forward as well. But I, I think we'll, we'll start to see that. Hopefully those investments from coming from uh, China in future will be coming from Chinese insurance companies and pension funds as they continue to grow AUM rather than uh, some state-sponsored uh, bank. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, well, it's actually, I find it uh, quite fascinating to be on a panel with diversified asset managers. Usually, there's like a couple of other private equity guys with me here. We have debt, we have direct investments. So I think it's, it's really very useful to, to get the complementary perspectives and to see that you know, on the debt side, on the capital market side, there's, there's also some movement. But on the private equity side, I'll say that some of the things that I hear as, as, as issues on the debt side, on the, on the stock market side, actually are the opportunities for, for us. So we're all kind of complementary in, in some ways. For example, um, the issue of managers not being shareholders, we make sure that um, we negotiate very detailed shareholders agreements and one of the things that, for example, we tend to insist on is making sure that there's upside for the managers. Um, and, and these are just structuring things that you put there as solutions to what you see as, 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 uh, um, as challenges or, 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 or problems out there. Now, one of the things that befuddles uh, investors a lot out there is the whole currency issue. Um, uh, and uh, I have to say, there's not been really uh, an actual solution for many, many years, but for the first time, we're starting to see some, some, some green shoots um, in terms of just the, the actual um, you know, creation of, a, of an actual yield curve in some of the, the, the local currencies, uh, and um, also the, the start of to see some of the banks create offshore vehicles that can create the beginning of some type of a, a, a swap and, and hedging market. But it's very, very early days, and regulators are either not understanding it fully or very worried and scared of it um, instead of actually encouraging it. But I think that um, I give it another you know, a couple of years and we'll start to see uh, that progress. Um, in the interim, what do we do? Um, we basically do what I just said about management. We do structuring. So for instance, we make sure that in a lot of the investment choices we make, um, there is an actual opportunity for cash on cash returns, meaning that you're not basically taking a huge punt and a bet on five years from now, we'll just come and give, make that mega exit and then give you all your money. And if it happens that there's a currency issue at that time, you got a problem. So we actually give people, uh, our investors money, money as, as, uh, as time goes through dividends, through uh, uh, what you call it, um, uh, various other uh, uh, preferred cash disbursements, and that, that actually helps so that you de-risk your principal. So by the time the exit comes, that is not necessarily 100% of, um, of the cash that you're giving your investors. And the, 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 the lower that is, the less you will have that risk, and you have plenty of time to sort of pick the right time to get the money out. Um, we managed to get... Uh, $25 million out of Nigeria 
last year in the middle of the worst time um, of getting uh, cash out of Nigeria. And we used three different tools. We used um, the futures market, believe it or not. So we used the spot market and we used swaps with some of the, the local banks that actually have assets outside and that uh, were willing to swap with us by you know, taking some of our, uh, our money uh, in country, obviously, for, for a fee. But overall, um, we had, had a blended cost of about 4 or 5% which I thought compared to about seven, eight, nine, ten percent that we started was, was pretty attractive um, to sort of be able to sort of exit our money out of Nigeria in the middle of a, of a crisis uh, as opposed to, 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 to regular, regular times. Lastly, on, on the stock markets, what we've started doing is we didn't just kind of wait. We're actually being proactive. We've gone to a couple of the stock exchanges and said to them, can we structure a joint venture whereby when our companies, when it's time for our companies to exit, it can be in some accelerated framework. Um, otherwise, you know, we, it just doesn't, it's not attractive to us in a relatively st a small stock market f for us to encourage them to do that. And we've uh, signed one with the BRVM uh, uh, in West Africa uh, that has about 14 West African countries that are uh, a member of that and we're um, working on a couple of other such uh, uh, um, uh, joint ventures to sort of give us another exit route for, um, for, for our investments. So I think there are a lot of possibilities. We don't know which one will be the winning formula that you know maybe three, four years from now at a conference like this will say, this is what everybody's doing, but um, we're keeping our feet moving. And I think uh, at some point, one of these will, will win over the others and will be hopefully in a position to come in and share that with you. In the interim, we're making do and actually making good returns for our investors. Thank you. Thank, <coughs> excuse me. Thanks, Ned. Um, well, as I mentioned, one of the things that we're trying to do is get more just data and information available. Um, and recently, we were looking at uh, different sectors that could be interesting, not just for institutional investors, but across asset, cl asset classes. And uh, the, we, we are just today publishing um, a healthcare trade and investment opportunity analysis that looks at, that highlights opportunities and trends uh, that investors and commercial partners should be aware of. Um, we'll be publishing one on digital connectivity and the creative economy soon, um, all of which are available at prosperafrica.gov. But what the healthcare sector study does, it really looks back on the past six years um, at the trends that have been happening and what the $2.2 billion that has gone into this sector, how investors are making that capital work. And while we're seeing you know, the brick and mortar investments um, on the rise, um, we're also seeing a lot of trends with venture capital, like $300 million since two, 2016. Um, and we see that growth um, across asset classes um, in healthcare speaks to increasing opportunities for larger institutions to gain exposure uh, via these funds. So I just wanted to mention that one, um, that one sector and ask for people to look out for the ones to come. Outstanding. Well, I, you know, transitioning on here, and, uh, Dean, I'm going to start with you on a question you actually passed to me. I'm going to send it right back to you in some of our offline chats. But how can development finance institutions and institutional investors work together, and what could that relationship look like? Hope to hear from all of you each about two minutes, but let's start with, let's start with Dean. Thanks very much, Ned. Um, <coughs> DFIs are, 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 have always been important, but specifically this year even more so. Last year, the, the you know, debt capital markets was, were flying. It, there was plenty of money knocking around, and, and it was pretty easy to get, to get deals away. Really, where we see DFIs now is, is, is absolutely key to being an anchor investor in debt deals that try to get done. You know, having, having a DFI, putting money to work in 10 to 20% of, of an issue, really helps to calm investor concerns on when it comes down to uh, due diligence. Uh, you know, it, it's great to have someone there that the investors trust, that they know that they've been on the ground and done that work. And it's, it, it really is a bit of a, a, a stamp of approval. <laughs> 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 
stamp of, a, of, of, appro <laughs> of approval. It's a test, so I think we're in good shape. I think, I think we're all right. Um, especially when it comes down to things like infrastructure projects, for example. Um, there's, a lot, there's, there's been a big growth in private debt mandates in emerging markets. <laughs> and uh, there's something that we think is a very positive development. But again, when you're coming down to a private debt mandate, potentially with a sovereign uh, guarantee for some infrastructure financing, you know, getting a DFI involved in, at, at, at uh, that base level is absolutely key. One thing I'd love them to do, though, is just speed up their turnaround times would be <laughs> pretty amazing. Yeah. Let, let, me, let me quickly say, you can tell the, expert, the professionals and the expertise, Dean did not miss a beat despite the warning alarm, so you could trust the advice uh, from a source like that. Let's go, David, let's go to you and then to Papa and then yeah, down but to no Leslie. One, no one could hear Dean, <laughs> and how can you promote Africa when you've got that going? Um, I'm not that good, I'm not as good as Dean. <laughs> I'll just wait a second. I assume this is part of the test. So. I'm going to assume it's part of the test. If for some reason we discover it's not a test, there's an okay. exit right there. I think, I, I think, I think we're all okay. Um, there we go. Now I have to get my... Development finance institutions <laughs> and how that working relationship with institutional investors may look. Yeah, I, I think uh, the, the investors that we're seeing today on... on private equity or, or uh, direct uh, financing into Africa tend to be more strategic investors who are not necessarily uh, looking, not necessarily to looking at investing in Africa, although they are, but they're looking for specific investments or, or industries that they can take uh, advantage of and bring their own expertise into Africa. Um, for example, pharmaceutical industry, uh, breweries, um, pretty much we see anything to do with food, snack food. Uh, foreign investors are, are looking for those particular uh, sectors to, to um, invest in. But I guess the real question is, well, how do, you, how do you get the word out? And as Dean and I were talking earlier today, um, the, 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 the bad news is, is that the big global banks have pretty much exited Africa. Mm -hmm. Most of the global banks deal with risk. You know, they have 18 different committees to go through to get approval to invest or do business in a particular country. And we're not in places like Nigeria or Zimbabwe or, or Cote d'Ivoire, some are similar places. Um, that's, that's the bad news. The good news is the people sitting on this panel all think it's a great opportunity. Um, so I just think you have to be focused and it's just harder to find the investors who are looking to Africa. I don't think it's so much as selling Africa as I think it is finding investors who will look at space in, in frontier markets, whether it's in Africa or Latin America or South Asia. That's a good point. Papa? Yeah, um, David, you're absolutely right. Um, I think it, it, it becomes an opportunity. Um, when the big banks were present in Africa, um, we didn't really see that many local banks thrive. Um, over the last four years, our bank in Ghana has grown on a compounded growth rate in net profit of 40%. Well, some of this is taken off by the CD, but that's another discussion. Um, but still, it's, it's amazing. And these guys have, have gone from zero to being number two in terms of uh, fintech and competing with a lot of the, the individual fintech companies. So they, local, local um, institutions do need to sort of be able to compete in a, in a more level playing field. So I think, you know, I, I really didn't have too much of a problem with the a lot of the large banks um, literally firing customers and leaving. Um, it's been an incredible opportunity um, across across the continent for local local banks. Now, coming back to the the, the point on um, DFIs and uh, what, what what how they could work in terms of uh, channeling capital into Africa. DFIs did start 
uh, the private equity sector in Africa. Uh, scary as that may sound, that is the case. Um, and they've done a phenomenal job of that. And um, now I think the big challenge for DFI is that I, I certainly will continue to, to sort of push that to them is that um, how they can actually uh, play nice with everybody around them because they have a significantly more information and experience. And it's very intimidating if you're a new investor to walk into a room or if you're a new anything to walk into a room and have two or three others who this is what they've done all their life. They know so much. They're at the level of granularity in the negotiation. Now, how do they use that to bring people along? Um, and I think sharing their information, their database, and maybe uh, that's something that, you know, Leslie, you guys could look into, uh, you know, seeing how you can just create a framework for information sharing where they can actually um, be a provider of comfort because there are very few sectors that they have not invested in in Africa, and they continue to be the leading, you know, uh, uh, a source of finance, certainly in, in, in private equity and some of the direct investments. Um, so I think that that is, is, is very, very uh, uh, important to keep in mind in terms of their role. The, the, the last thing I'll say on the DFIs and how they can help is that they also have a track record. Now, how that track record is presented is very, very important. Because if you're a development finance institution, I underscore the word development. So the way you deploy capital sometimes is not necessarily related to profit, share, uh, profit seeking. You're trying to develop a sector, you're trying to start something. So what returns do you expect to get? Pretty low returns on average generally. So when you present your overall track record, and let's say my fund is in it, and then there's another fund that was supposed to help um, you know, gorillas you know, per, you not disappear in a certain part, That's, that fund is not going to make that much money. But the blended overall uh, portfolio is going to be low. So you present that to somebody who's looking to make money, they get confused. So I think being able to parse and to, to sort of really present uh, uh, the, the track record of DFIs and defend it is, is very important because uh, they have the most comprehensive track record on the continent right now. There's, there's no question about it. Thank you. you know, and, and Papa, you know, one of the things I really appreciated your comment a bit earlier was um, as, as we come sort of to the close of this conversation, which we can continue out in the, the networking hall uh, for anyone who's so interested, but the idea of making investments require courage. They require connections and trips and a number of things, but that, that courage piece is so important. I will add that the other components, the business intelligence, the commercial diplomacy, the, the, um, uh, the technical assistance, uh, that's also such a key, big key to, to any conversation, and that's why I'm excited to have Prosper Africa in the room um, for background. I, when I was in the U.S. government, I helped build Prosper Africa with a team of outstanding, uh, outstanding individuals, bringing together the agencies like Commerce and USAID, State and Energy, all around the same table. And now we have Leslie here, and, and Leslie, I understand you may have something to share for our group about Prosper Africa and, and bring us to a close here. Thanks so much, Ned, and um, I really appreciate that you are there in the early days and um, are continue to act as an advisor and and friend to the initiative. Um, I was already able to, though one of the points I wanted to make is to talk about the, the new study, but I, I think just to mention that this is a conversation that um, is increasingly important for Prosper and the U.S. government, and we are looking to pull it through to December for the U.S. Africa Leaders Summit and Business Forum, where President Biden will be hosting heads of state, um, and there'll be a, a day dedicated to just private sector uh, conversations and strengthening the trade investment relationship between the U.S. and countries in Africa, and at least a session can, uh, fully dedicated to financing um, infrastructure and sustainable growth. So I uh, hope that some of you will be part of that conversation um, and looking forward to continuing to work with you. Outstanding. Well, we are right on time. A big round of applause for outstanding panelists. <laughs>